And we are on to Paladin, which includes an imprisoned minion that is not a demon. Apparently, in addition to demons, we've gotten around to imprisoning murlocs for all of their crimes against humanity, which is understandable because of what they do to low-level characters in World of Warcraft. This is Imprisoned Sungill. It one cost 2-1. It is dormant for two turns, and when it wakes up, summon two 1-1 one -one murlocs. This card actually seems pretty good to me. Uh, if you think about like how a lot of Murloc decks want to play out, they're kind of critical mass type decks. And you know, being able to play this on turn one, and then you know, you actually are happy that it's not in play for your opponent to kill it right away. And then there's turn two, okay, it doesn't come in. Turn three, this comes into play, and you immediately cold light sear them and have a board that's much harder for your opponent to kill. Um, so this card I think is actually quite interesting. Um, it obviously doesn't have like a dormant trigger that messes with your opponent or anything, but it has one that you can set up and plan for um, with health buffs or attack buffs or whatever else. I think it's actually you know very valuable and and if anything upside. Um, obviously, being able to play this for one and get four power immediately would be great. Um, but uh, I feel like there, this is a, a a card that you can very easily plan for and uh, and try to set up to have those more powerful Murloc turns without having to build to them and leave the minions exposed in the meantime. Next up we have Librum of Justice. Uh, Paladins have kind of this weird, it's a weird habit of getting like almost entire, you know, like new themes in, in a lot of sets. It's like one of the designers even like joked like, you know, here's where the, the wheel of Paladin mechanics came this time. And Librums are an interesting mechanic in that not only are there the individual Librum cards, but there are cards that interact with each of the Librums, specifically reducing their cost, um, which obviously can be extremely powerful uh, to allow you to play, you know, something like this earlier in the game. This, I think, is actually the Librum of Justice. You know, you look at it first, and it, I think it looks kind of weak. Equip a 1-4 weapon, change the health of all enemy minions to 1. One of the key things there is enemy. This only affects opposing minions. So if you use this with, say, Wild Pyromancer... Uh, it also, by the way, only health, not attack. So you can use this while Pyromancer and kill all your opponent's stuff and not your own. That's a really big deal. One of the big problems for especially mid-range Paladin style decks has historically been that it is difficult to continue applying pressure while actually dealing with your opponent's minions. So this is very, very similar to a quality and just your opponent's stuff obviously doesn't affect their uh, attack like Shrink Ray does, but be able to equality your opponent's stuff and then like attack it it a makes it much better to be you know for a mid-range deck that actually has its own board and b gives you ways to like use a lot of the healing that paladins had because you're able to attack into those minions with the weapon that it automatically equips so i think this is actually a very very powerful card um i you know i feel like i've seen some people say that they think this sucks i think that even outside of the Librum cost reduction this feels like it's actually a decent card because it allows you to deal with you know a bunch of like, this by itself is six mana attack and kill a minion basically because you reduce its health to one and equip the weapon and then also has the ability to be cost reduced interact with other cards etc so i just think this is a, a very solid card um, and i expect it to see possibly even play outside of Librem focus decks next up we have underlight angling rod another murloc card three cost three two weapon after your hero attacks at a random murloc to your hand one of the things that Paladin uh, can struggle with, and one of the things that Murloc decks can struggle with, uh, is running out of resources, right? Paladins, uh, since Divine Favor rotated in their sort of uh, aggressive decks, especially now that Christology, which was, by the way, bananas powerful, especially at one mana, is rotating out, one of the things they need is the ability to actually generate resources. This is a weapon that is totally reasonably statted. You know, you get like the Stormhammer slash now Fiery War Axe slash Eaglehorn Bow stats and every time you attack you get another murloc um so you know I, I feel like this is actually a pretty powerful card overall even in just like a regular mid-range deck that it, it doesn't necessarily have murloc synergy maybe this is reasonable because it just generates you know some decent stuff i think it's it's unlikely that's the case because a lot of murlocs are pretty low impact but if you have any kind of murloc synergies i think this feels like it's a pretty strong card overall where have we gotten in murloc naming this guy is literally murger murgurgle Murger, Murgurgle. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, it's two cost, two one Divine Shield. And I think that Divine Shield uh, on a Murloc is actually a really big deal. Uh, Murlocs are typically very fragile. And one of the, 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 the issues with, you know, Murlocs is that you know, you're looking to uh, power them up with stuff like War Leader. Um, but 
it is difficult to keep them on the board because they're they're fragile. Um, and Murgur, Murgurgle, with Divine Shield, obviously, is much more likely to survive until the next turn and be able to be buffed by stuff like Coldblood Seer or War Leader or whatever else. And once that happens, once he does die, Murgur, Murgurgle gives you Murgurgle Prime, which is an 8-cost 6-3 with Divine Shield... Uh, it summons four random Murlocs and gives them Divine Shield. And one of the things about, like, aggressive decks in general, and, like, a Murloc deck, for instance, is that you don't want to have big endgame finisher-type cards in your deck in general because they can glut up your hand. Um, and, you know, if you if you end up having, like, a seven-cost card that, that get, you know, means that you don't have enough stuff to actually play a, you know, powerful curve early on, um, you guys end up losing the game. Well, this is a extremely powerful uh, card, you know, eight cost card that gives you a divine shielded board that you don't even have to put in your deck. You don't risk having your opening hand and disrupting your curve. You get it off of the Murgur Murgurgle dying in the death rattle, putting that in your deck. So a lot of these primes are cards that you, you imagine putting into like like mid range or slower controlling decks. This can very easily just go into an aggro deck, like a, a you know, full on aggro Murloc deck and ends up just like giving you this late game finisher in the form of Murder Girl Prime um, off of just the death rattle from the initial initial body. So I think this is actually a very, very good card um, for a Murloc Paladin deck. Um, and I think that, you know, we've seen between the Imprisoned Murloc and the Underlay Angle Irad um, a number of additional support cards that could lead that deck to being uh, fairly strong. Next up we have Aldor Attendant. Just two cost, two, three. Reduce the cost of your Librams by one this game. We talked a little bit earlier, obviously, about the uh, the other Librams. Uh, I feel like the Librams seem like they're pretty strong in general. Um, I don't know necessarily how many of the Librum cost reduction cards you necessarily want to play in uh, in a deck. Maybe just play all of them in all the Librams. Obviously, that, that can easily go together. Uh, what, you know, what else you play is a kind of a big question mark. One of the things that, that this all led me to think about is Pure Paladin. I've actually been playing a decent amount of Pure Paladin just you know for fun on ladder leading up to the release of the expansion and having some decent success with it. And it obviously loses a lot of the powerful cards uh, in the uh, the form of the, the mechs and such. But the Librams are all powerful, you know, at least reasonably powerful cards for that style of deck. And having a bunch of Paladin cards that your deck already naturally has synergy with in the pool of stuff that you can get randomly off of Crusader in the form of the uh, other Librams and Librams Synergy cards is actually pretty good for that kind of deck. So uh, that's one of the decks that I'm actually definitely going to experiment with is pure Librum Paladin. Uh, and you know, I feel like there's just a lot of things that, that fit very well together there that I'm looking forward to trying. Next up we have Librum of Hope. It's a nine cost spell, restore eight health, summon an eight eight guardian with taunt and divine shield. This is obviously one of the cards that very much cares about the cost reduction of your Librams because being able to play this for 8 mana or 7 mana or 5 mana um, with the cost reduction from uh, the various cards that reduce the cost of your Librams is a very big deal. One thing that's very important to note, this is a targeted effect, which means that you will get it to return it to your hand with Lady Liadrin, which we'll get to briefly, uh, we'll get to in just a moment. This this is a, just a very, very powerful card. One of the problems with a lot of the healing effects in Paladin, you know, stuff, stuff like Lay on Hands. Obviously, Lay on Hands is part healing effect, part card draw, but like the, the, the healing effects, a lot of them just don't really give you that much board presence. This gives you a huge amount of board presence with an 8-8 Taunt Divine Shield attached to it. So I feel like this is, a, this is quite a powerful card that really justifies playing the cost reduction Librum stuff, um, or rather the Librum cost reduction stuff in your deck, and, you know, can be a... Uh, uh, a way to sustain, um, and obviously you have the sort of card draw, uh, card advantage tool that they all work together with Lady Liadrin. Next up we have Librum of Wisdom. This is basically Explorer's Hat, but it's a Paladin card. Uh, give a minion plus one, plus one, and Death Rattle, add a Librum of Wisdom spell to your hand. So yeah, this is effectively Explorer's Hat, if you remember that card from way back in the day, League of Explorers. And I feel like it fits better in Paladin than it did in Hunter. You know, buffing your minions over and over and over works very well in a class that can generate additional minions and also cares about targeting your minions, whether it's for Galvadon Quest. Clearly we need this in Wild. We're doing it. Um, and also, crucially, the fact that this is a Librum uh, does mean that all the cost reduction effects uh, apply to it and the uh, subsequent copies. So... If you have like the your Librams cost two less, you just play this and you always have this for free whenever you actually uh, play it on a minion, which is very, very powerful. 
So obviously you can't just like keep playing something like a Sound the Bells with Echo or whatever, but it is, I think, a very strong card in that style of deck that cares about targeting your stuff, that cares about buffing your minions, and cares about reducing the cost of your Librams. And next up we have Aldor Truthseeker, basically big Librum cost reduction card. This is the bookkeeper right here. He's got his uh, got his big tome open to reduce the cost of things. Five cost, four, six taunt. So totally decent combination of, of stats to go with his ability. And I, you know, I can easily imagine some versions of, of decks that are using the Librams not necessarily playing the two drop and only playing this guy because this guy obviously is much more impactful in terms of reducing the cost of your Librams as well as just having a more relevant combination of stats and, uh, and ability. Um, that said... Uh, I feel like if, if you are playing like Librem of Wisdom, um, you're totally happy just playing early minions to have things to buff with it, especially when your buff is going to cost like one or zero. So, uh, you know, I, I feel like the, the two buff guys, this is the, the better one, obviously. I mean, it's also the more expensive one, but I, I, you know, I feel like if I can easily imagine just playing two of this guy in a deck and not necessarily playing the other one, and certainly not vice versa. And next up we have what is, I think, quietly possibly just the best Paladin card in the set. Two cost, give a minion plus two plus two, draw a card. Hand of a doll. I think this is just a fantastically powerful card that I'm very happy that Paladin has. Um, Paladin kind of struggles with card draw since uh, Define, Va Define Favor went to the Hall of Fame, and having a, you know a card draw effect, which is also a buff card, you know it's basically just a cycling buff card. I think it's just very very appropriate for uh, for Paladin and just also very good. Being able to you know, cycle through and find your uh, your key cards is very important for basically any deck. Um, but yeah, I think this is just like really, really good. You know, it allows you to trade up with your uh, your early minions. Uh, makes stuff like you know any kind of early minion is 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 so much more impactful when you're able to buff them in a way that they can actually trade up. And you know, having the threat of not only blessing of kings on four mana, but also hand of it all on two mana, I think is a very, very big deal. So this card is great. It's just like universally awesome if you're playing a minion based deck. And I expect to see pr more of this card than any other Paladin card from this set played. I think this is the best Paladin card in the set. And speaking of targeting your minions with spells, Lady Leodrin, 7 cost, 4-6, legendary. Battlecry, add a copy of each spell you cast on friendly characters this game to your hand. It's a lot like uh, Lanessa Sunstrider, or Sunshadow, Sun whatever. Lanessa, whatever, whatever her name was. The dungeons reeked of magic. Lady Leodrin, which by the way is the only hero portrait I don't have because I refused to get back into World of Warcraft and then I played Classic anyway for like two days and then thankfully the servers were too overloaded and I couldn't log in and I managed to keep myself from getting re-addicted again. Anyway, Lady Liadrin, the fact that this is friendly characters, not friendly minions, I think is a very big deal because it means that if you say, you say like, holy light your face, right? If you Librem of Hope your face, you get back that Librem Hope when you play Lady Leodrin. That is a, a huge deal. The fact that you know this can bring back your spell that generates an 8-8 Divine Shield taunt makes this so much more impactful than it would be otherwise. If you just heal yourself, and again, that, that card can cost like, you know, four mana or whatever if you use the cost reduction effects. So I think Lady Leodrin is very good and uh, a very powerful payoff for the, especially the Librem based decks, simply because Librem Hope is the Probably the best thing that you can bring back with her. And we are on to Shaman. First up, we have Serpent Shrine Portal. Uh, three cost spell, deal three damage, summon a random three cost minion with overload one. This is just powerful. Dealing three damage to either opponent's minion or the opponent's face, just powerful tempo, powerful you know burn potential. Three cost minions, obviously there's a wide range of possible results, but you know, like you're not dealing with a, a, a cost that has like really poor uh, overall, uh, mana with, like, lots of powerful battle cry minions or something like that. You know, you're gonna, you're gonna get lots of, like, two fours and three threes and whatever else. Um, so yeah, I think it's just a solid card. I don't know necessarily what the deck that you play this in. There's, like, the, the spell shaman is definitely, uh, something that, uh, obviously can utilize this as both removal and tempo. But, uh, yeah, I just think it's a solid card. Probably see a good amount of play. You can get some of the primes with this, right? There's three cost primes that can come off this. You can get like a comma, who we were just talking about, and that could be sweet. Uh, I think Mishifin Prime is also three, and Lady Vosh I think is also three. So you know, lots of, of possible high rolls in this too. Uh, but yeah, overall I think this is just a solid card that we'll definitely uh, definitely see play. 
Next up we have Vivid Spores, four cost spell, give your minions death rattle, resummon this minion. There's been a lot of cards like this in Shaman. You know, there's like, uh, obviously there's like uh, Ancestral Spirit, which is just gives this to a single minion. We've seen stuff like, I'm trying to remember the names of something, Spirit Echo, that, you know, gives your minions all uh, death rattle return to your hand. It's hard for me to evaluate this card. I think this card it, you know, you'd have to have a very specific deck to utilize this. You probably want some sort of like death rattle deck that like you're you're like AOEing the board and putting this, you know, on like a bunch of things that like you you, you know, you're going to be killing yourself pretty often. But this is just like like pretty slow, pretty clunky and feels like you need a, a, a pretty specific board to like care about playing this instead of just playing like an ancestral spirit. You need to have more things that you want to be vivid sporing. Um, so overall, I, I'm, I'm not super impressed by this. Maybe you're using this like on like just a board of, uh, of minions that you're like hoping to just keep around for bloodlust, right? Like maybe that's what this is, is, is kind of like bloodlust protection. You're just playing, you know, you have whatever sort of murloc board or something and you just vivid spores it. So if your opponent AOEs, you're able to, to protect it for bloodlust. But like, is that really even just better than like soul of the murloc, right? Which costs two rather than four. So yeah, I feel like this is. Pretty expensive, pretty clunky, and probably won't see that much play. Next up, we have Bog Spine Knuckles. Uh, five cost weapon. After hero attacks, transform your minions into random ones that cost one more. It's a 4-2. I like this card. Um, I think this card is cool. I, I think that, obviously, you know, evolve cards are, are often pretty polarizing. I like the fact that this is a weapon that you can, like, get, like, locked and loaded to be able to swing when you actually have a board you want to evolve. Obviously your opponent can interact with it too, they can kill it. You know, Zephyrus means that every deck can possibly have weapon removal. This is a four attack weapon, it's not like a one attack weapon, so Zephyrus will care about it. It also means that it, it can be some sort of board control as well. But yeah, I think this is this is a neat card. I doubt this is gonna be like a, a highly, you know, competitive card. And frankly, I think it's probably good. You know, the, the metagame that we had when Evolve came back from Wild and we were like, Evolve a Desert uh, Herring, was pretty miserable so uh you know I, I hope that it's not like something that, that's everywhere because when it is it's it's really like it's pretty frustrating to play against but i know that i'm gonna be playing this and i'm gonna be having a blast speaking of evolve cards that uh hopefully aren't too good bog struck clacker three cost battle cry transform adjacent minions to random minions that cost one more this guy's cool um there's a lot of battle cry minions in shaman stuff like uh, like Storm Chaser, is Storm Chaser rotating out? I'm not entirely sure. I think it might be. Um, but, but there's just a lot of stuff that that Shaman, you know, like likes to have battle cries up to the battle cry quest and everything that are like relatively low impact, pretty poor stats for their cost, and then being able to evolve them up afterwards can be pretty valuable. Um, it can also just, you know, this is actually just not like horrible if you're just using it to evolve totems. You just like evolve two totems, you know, get a three three, and then two totems into two drops not a disaster it's you know it is a battle cry effect which is not as relevant as it once was because of the rotation of shutterwalk may shutterwalk rest in peace but uh but yeah i, I feel like this is a cool card um uh, much like the bogs by knuckles i don't think that it's likely to see tons of play i don't i can't really think of of like like doppelgangster or desert hair type cards that are around right is desert hair actually still around i'm actually not sure off the top of my head whether desert hair is a, is uh rotating or not i think it is still around because otherwise it would have been around when mutate was as well oh no it's yeah it is it is good oh no it is still around yeah desert hair will still be around so you could you could be desert hair bog stalking uh or bog spire knuckling um but that's not nearly as scary as desert hair evolving because both of them are much slower and your opponent has a chance to eat, to, to kill the desert hairs or it's at least happening uh you know on a turn that that is not three <laughs> Next up, we have Lady Vash, who is uh, the prime in Shaman. Spell damage plus one, four, three, four, three. Four, three, four, three. Three mana. Get it. Uh, anyway, this is you know uh, a, a decently powerful card by uh, on the front side. Um, Shaman has a lot of ways to use spell damage. You know, they have like Lightning Storm and you know variety of stuff like that that they can you know scale off of spell damage pretty well. Lightning Bolt, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and then, obviously, uh, the Death Rattle sh Shuffle Vash Prime into your deck gives you, boom, Vash Prime, who is spell damage plus one with Battle Cry draw three spells, reduce their cost by three. So this feels like the sort of card that, you know, very, uh, very likely wants to go into, like, an aggressive Shaman deck. 
Uh, if you if you want the spell damage, you're very likely to be wanting want to play stuff like Lightning Bolt or Lava Burst. And Vash Prime, you draw that, you draw three spells, you reduce the cost by, by three, and then you have spell damage plus one, and you're just like, okay, Bolt, Bolt, Burst you, or Burst, Burst, Bolt you. It's just like tons of damage that can come out of that. Um, obviously, with Vash Prime, uh, if you're on that plan, you don't want to just have a, uh, a bunch of random spells in your deck that like Vash Prime drawing would be poor with. You want to have as many like damaging spells as possible. But obviously, we already saw Serpent Shire Port or Serpent Shrine Portal. Serpent Shrine Portal, you know, can is a, a damaging spell that costs three mana that you can draw off Vash Prime to you know de deal four to something and summon a minion. Um, so yeah, I think that this is you know a, a powerful card. Uh, I feel like to maximize the value of Vosh Prime, you definitely want to be building your deck in such a way that you have as many cards that are damaging spells that cost three or less as possible uh, in order to you know be able to get that sort of real burst as soon as you play Vosh Prime. Next up, we have Torrent. It's a five-cost spell, deals eight damage to a minion, costs three less if you guys have spelled uh, last turn. This is maybe a card that goes into a Vosh deck uh, because it is a spell that cares about spells, which Vosh does, and you can cast off Vosh Prime, but it does only damage minions. I feel like, you know, like a this is just a, a strong card for a board control style deck, so maybe not, you know, a bird style deck that, that I was just advocating that Vosh Prime wants. Uh, but yeah, this is just a, a, a efficient way to remove basically any minion. You know, eight damage is a lot, kills everything. Um, up to giants, and you know, there's only even sea giant these days. But yeah, you know, there's also just like you know a lot of synergies with spells in general in shaman. Um, and you have like the serpent shrine portal that is a minion that's also a spell basically. So yeah, I feel I feel like this is just a solid card uh, that can see play in any kind of like mid range or or control shaman deck that has a decent number of spells. Obviously, this is fairly poor in a control matchup where your opponent doesn't necessarily have big things or you know against uh a like really really fast deck you know even just spending two to kill like a minion isn't necessarily good but if you're like aoeing and then able to follow up and kill their big thing i think it's a really big deal next up we have totemic reflection give a minion plus two plus two if it's a totem summon a copy of it sadly nightmare amalgam is rotating so you can't like totemic reflection your amalgam and get two five sixes this is a pretty funny card there's just all these like totem cards in Shaman all the time, and they, like it feels like they never quite come together. But right now, there's actually a Totemic Surge and Totemic Might and Totemic Reflection all in the format at the same time. And Splitting Axe, can we actually make a totem deck? Is this the key? Is Totemic Reflection the card that will finally make Totemic Might into a powerhouse? The answer is no, but we can try. Next up, we have Shattered Rumbler, which incidentally, this is not the final version of the card. Um, this is the version of the card that went out in the, uh, the preview, the spoiler. This is the version of the card that I saw during the uh, the summit. This is the version of the card that they had a gameplay trailer of, and then they changed the version of the card. Because now it is, if you cast a spell last turn, deal two damage to all other minions. It doesn't damage itself. So that's actually kind of a big deal. Because, you know, there's a big difference between a 4-4 four, four body that you get afterwards and then a 4-6 body. Um, obviously, this, is, you know, is a strong card in uh, a, uh, a controlling spell deck, which is where, you know, kind of like the, the Torrent deck, this wants to be in the same deck, obviously. Um, and this is, the, this is the small minion version of Torrent, which is the big minion version. You know, this actually just seems like a, a pretty solid card for a control deck. Two damage to all minions, you know, be able to wipe out stuff like Treants and, you know, like Imps from Galakrond, things like that. Uh, just seems like a, a totally solid card overall. It's pretty metagame dependent, you know, how good is two damage to all minions. Uh, can you, you know, can you back it up with other stuff if, the, if things are uh, bigger than that? You know, but Shaman has a pretty wide variety of removal options, especially if it's a, a spell-heavy Shaman deck. So I feel like this is, you know, likely to have quite a bit of support and pretty pretty likely to seize at least some amount of play. And last but not least is the legendary The Lurker Below. 6 cost 6-3, six, three, deal 3 damage to an enemy minion. If it dies, repeat on one of its neighbors. So uh, if 2 damage is not enough from uh, the Shattered Rumbler, 3 damage from The Lurker Below... Boom, 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 boom. You got got lackeys lined up in a row. Boom, 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 boom. I feel like this card is actually like pretty good. Obviously, very contingent on what the metagame looks like, what minions are around. This feels like uh, against any kind of token deck, obviously super powerful. Any kind of uh, of small minion deck in general. 
uh, very, very powerful. Uh, it, it is a card that will cause people to question their positioning against Shaman, because, you know, you don't want to have a bunch of small things next to each other than a big thing in the end. You want to have your big things kind of in the middle, sort of media, you know, the opposite of meteor positioning. But yeah, I think this is just a, a solid card for, you know, like any kind of AoE style situation. Not a uh, not a card that uh, I, I think necessarily goes into like every shaman deck, but seems like a totally solid tempo play against any kind of any kind of uh, minion based deck. And I totally accidentally skipped this one. Marsh spawn. Lurker was not last. Lurker was not least. This is now last, but this is also not least. Uh, Battle cry. If you cast a spell last turn, discover a spell three four four three. This card is just good. You know, if you play a spell, you discover a spell, and it's a, a totally reasonable body. It's, Elemental doesn't really matter that much right now. You know, not really a lot of elemental synergy type stuff anymore. But yeah, I mean, discovering a spell on a, a solid body, I think is totally, totally solid. Shaman has a lot of spells that can just kind of cast for free. We obviously all already saw Serpent Shrine Portal, which is like a reasonable, just like tempo play that gives you a body that is a spell. You can play this in like Farsight. I believe Haunting Echoes is, or uh, yeah, Haunting Echoes, not Haunting Echoes. Uh, Haunting Visions is rotating, um, I believe the Witchwood card, so that is one of the, the you know, really easy ways to uh, just dig for, uh, you know, dig with spells, uh, do spell discovery, etc., free spells essentially. That's gone, but there's still a lot of other options available to help support this alongside the, the Rumbler and Torrent, so uh, I feel like this is just a really solid card, uh, you know, in any kind of uh, mid-rangey spell heavy shaman deck and i feel like there's a lot of tools to go in that direction in this set all right next we are on to rogue we're starting off with bamboozle which i have to say is a fantastic name and a really neat card uh it's a secret when one of your minions that attacked transform into a random one that costs three more this uh this is pretty pretty hilarious uh, first of all the art is great right it's like haha i'm not actually a murloc i'm an ogre um but this is like a very unique effect in Rogue. Uh, you know, obviously we haven't seen anything like this in in Rogue before. Um, and I, I, a, I like the theme of secrets returning to Rogue in general. I also think that giving Rogue, you know, some way to, you know, leverage like right now this is an extremely powerful card with like evil miscreant, right? Something like that. Your opponent's like, oh, I'm gonna go ahead and attack into, you know, kill your small minion, kill your evil miscreant, kill like whatever. And you're like, sorry, it's actually. You know, a, like, boulder fist ogre. It's like, smush, oh god, my face. Um, so yeah, I think this is this is a cool card. Obviously will discourage people from attacking into minions against rogue uh, if you have a secret in play. Um, and overall, I just think it's pretty solid, pretty powerful. Obviously not able to use this proactively um, like you can other evolve effects, but I think this is, uh, you know, in a secret rogue deck, this would be a very powerful card. Next up we have Shadow Jeweler Hanar. Two costs, one five. After you play a secret, discover a secret from a, a different class. This card seems incredibly powerful. Like, this card seems super, super, super good in any kind of secret rogue deck. It's To begin with, it's a two cost, one five. Very, very hard to kill. And then every time you play a secret, you just get a new secret. So, like, if you play this, say you just play this turn four. Play a secret. Put it as a kill it right away. Okay, next turn you're like, secret, secret. Secret, 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 secret. It's like, actually just seems fantastic. And I feel like Secret Rogue, obviously there's no secrets uh, in Rogue over the past year. So it needs some powerful tools in order to justify playing Secret Rogue. And uh, this is definitely a powerful tool for that deck. I think this is going to be uh, one of you know the, the most powerful cards in that deck that exists. Perhaps the most powerful card in, in a, uh, a Secret Rogue deck. Uh, and definitely a, a very, very strong incentive to build that deck in the first place. Next up we have Spy Mistress. One cost, three one stealth. Pretty simple. Very good and aggressive rogue deck. If you're looking to be like a, a face style rogue, this is as good as it gets, right? You just get a three power guy your opponent can't kill before it gets a chance to attack. Very, very powerful. Um, I do like the fact that rogue getting some stealth themed stuff because uh, that's obviously a core element of the, the idea of Rogue. Um, and I, I don't think this is like busted or anything. Morgan Infiltrator, you know, with plus one attack isn't gonna, you know, ruin the metagame or anything like that. But I do think this is overall just like a, a very solid card. And uh, I, I think that, you know, it'll definitely see play in any kind of aggressive Rogue deck. And, you know, a lot of just tempo decks, period, 
Uh, because even, you know, a lot of times the weakness, as I mentioned many times in this review, of uh, early one health minions, your opponent can kill it with a hero power, and, well, this is stealth. So, bare minimum, this is going to get a chance to attack once. Uh, very often going to be able to trade up as well. Speaking of stealth synergy cards, and a very good card with, uh, oh, with the Spymaster, uh, Ash Tongue Slayer. Uh, two cost, three, two, battle cry, give me stealth minion plus three attack and immune this turn. So again, stealth synergy stuff, very, very powerful. Uh, you can play that, uh, that, you know, three, one, ash tongue slayer it, boom, five damage immune, trade way up, not even trade, just get them. You can either, you know, you can either, uh, not even five, six, six damage. And you can use this to either just, you know, uh, kill opponent, uh, a large opposing minion or go face for bonus damage. Again, you know, I think that uh, I like the fact that we're seeing stealth synergy cards in Rogue. Feels like uh, secrets and stealth feel like Rogue things that they should be good at, rather than just you know the sort of uh, tempo type plays that we've seen before. Um, and I uh, I really like this card, and I uh, I expect this to see a, a pretty decent amount of play, if only because I think the 3-1 Stealth is so good, and this obviously pairs very well with it. Next up we have Cursed Vagrant, a 7 cost, 7-5 seven, with Death Rattle, summon a 7-5 Shadow with Stealth. Um, this feels like it's pretty expensive to, to be a, uh, a card that I'm looking to necessarily play in a constructed deck, but it does feel like, it, A, it's very powerful if you're going to play this in Arena. It seems like crazy busted. But, you know, this is very, very good against any kind of uh, removal-based strategy. You know, if your opponent is looking to, like, AoE you, it's like, oh, okay, well, you killed my 7-5, and now there's another 7-5. Um, I just think it's, a, it's, you know, probably a little too slow is my guess for Constructed in general, because it doesn't do anything immediately when it hits the board. Uh, doesn't protect you either but you know if there's a a sort of slower you know more sort of uh controlling rogue type deck this can be a good way for them to get around removal to get around aoe um because you know even if you kill it it leaves another minion that's even harder to deal with behind so uh, i don't really expect this to see play and if it does i think it's a sort of corner case weird deck metagame kind of thing next up we have ambush a secret when your opponent plays a minion summon a two three ambusher with poisonous um this just seems like a very solid secret this is a secret that's kind of interesting because that you know it, in the early turns if you play the you know the ambush opponent just plays like a small minion they can easily kill your your ambusher but like one of the big things about uh about this like rogue is very good at killing small things with dagger and with stuff like backstab and everything so, you know, you if you're able to, like, kind of keep the board clear, it can be difficult for your opponent to get a, uh, a board presence uh, because, like, your sort of mid-game stuff just get, ends up getting ambushed away. So, yeah, I think this is, you know, just a generally solid card. Obviously, if you're playing Secret Rogue, not that many secrets to choose from, so this one's going to go in your deck. Um, I, I don't really think this is a card we're going to see played outside of, like, Secret or, like, Highlander-type Rogue because Rogue has so many other good ways to uh, kill or you know de otherwise deal with individual minions, but I do think this feels like a solid secret for the Secret Rogue deck. Similar to this, uh, Dirty Tricks, after your opponent casts a spell, draw two cards. There's a lot of spells, right? <laughs> uh, the fact that this triggers off of coin, you get two cards off of it, seems very good, even against uh, minion heavy decks that don't have many spells, it's just a, a very, very solid card. Uh, you know, two cards is yeah, you know, totally reasonable card draw for two, and very easy condition to meet. So I think this is just a you know again solid card. We'll go into secret decks. Could even see this maybe going into non-secret decks because it is so likely to just be a cycle effect in uh, a lot of situations. It could play like, like maybe play like one of these in like a you know miracle style rogue deck because it can help you just dig through your deck as a a cheap way to draw cards. That even you know if you if you actually draw it as part of your miracle chain, great, it's a two cost spell. Early on, you know, it can just be a, 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 a something you play down and can easily cycle through and get you other stuff if your opponent ever plays a spell. Next up is Greyheart Sage, three cost three three battle cry. If you control a stealth minion, draw two cards. Another stealth synergy thing. And this is a powerful one. It's, you know, draw two attached to a 3-3 three, three is is very, very good. You know, between this and the the ambusher that, that gives plus three attack and immune, there's a lot of incentive to play uh, to play stealth minions and rogue in this set. So I can easily see rogue being pushed in that direction. A lot of the, the problem that you end up having in rogue minion-based decks is they do sort of run out of resources. Obviously, that's not necessarily the case in the world of Galakrond rogue decks right now, because uh, Lackey's Togwaggle, all that action gives you a lot of extra resources. But if you're trying to play, you know, a, a non-Lackey based deck, if you're playing more sort of traditional tempo rogue style deck, running out of cards happened a lot. 
Um, and this is, you know, a card that can go into a sort of stealth tempo rogue style deck and dig you for more resources while being a, you know, a totally decent body. 3-3 three, three for 3, obviously not incredible by any means, but 3-3 three, three for 3 that draws two cards is pretty amazing. And next we have Black Jack Stunner. This is serious. This is a 1 cost, 1-2. One, Battle Cry, if you control a secret, return a minion to its owner's hand, it costs 2 more. This is basically a 1 cost targeted freezing trap if you have a secret. And, you know, like, this is, if you have, if you have a, a secret, it's, you know, so cheap to use this that, like, you know, this feels like one of the, one of the, the, the major, major powerful cards in the Rogue Secret decks. This card is, you know, I feel like very, very strong. And obviously, you know, in order to get Rogue to play secrets, I gotta have good reasons to play the secrets. This and the, uh, uh, the discover a secret when you play a secret are all the reason I need. I feel like, you know you have just a lot of tools into a, a rogue secret deck that seem very powerful. Uh, let's figure out the, the rest of the surrounding shell obviously feels like the big open question, but you know, sap is already obviously a powerful card in rogue. This is a cheaper, better sap. If you have a secret, obviously it's a minion rather than a spell, which on the one hand means that you can't like cycle through it and prep it out and, you know, use like auctioneer or whatever, but it also means you can shadow step it. You can blackjack stunner, shadow step blackjack stunner, and bounce your opponent's things, and you know force them to not be replayed on curve because of the freezing trap style effect. So I feel like this is very very powerful, uh, and definitely a a strong incentive to build secret rogue. And the last card we have in rogue, uh, another card for stealth rogue, or just for a rogue deck, a comma, three four stealth for three. That's like already pretty good, right? Like a 3-4 a, a stealth, it, you know, this can trade into things. Your opponent can't stop it from being able to trade into things or get the damage in because it's stealth. And then the prime you get in your deck is a 6-5 permanently stealthed for 6, which means your opponent can never attack it, can never target it, can never silence it unless they have a mass to spell. This card, I think, is pretty sick. I, I do want to point a couple things out. One... Obviously, it can go very well into the stealth deck because the stealth deck cares about having stealth minions. But two, this synergizes very well. Both halves of this synergize very well with the stealth cards that we've seen, the stealth synergy cards that we've seen. A comma prime. One of the, the obviously one of the drawbacks of the prime cards is that well, you have to get the thing to die and then then find the other one. Having the stealth guy that draws you cards makes you get that much closer to a comma prime then once a comma prime comes into play you can use the guy who gives immune to your stealth minions to attack a comma prime into your opponent's things kill them and a comma prime will just never die never your opponent will never be able to kill it because it's stealth it just seems really sweet this seems like a very powerful card that really gives you massive rewards for your stealth deck or you can just play this in a rogue deck and feel fine about it because three four stealth for three by itself is just pretty good and then the reward of getting a 6-5 permanently stealth for 6 you can just keep hitting your opponent in the face they can only ever AoE away is pretty powerful also in Rogue you can play Stowaway Stowaway you know you don't have like academic espionage and stuff anymore but being able to stow away and get your Akama Prime immediately after your Akama dies is also pretty appealing so I'm excited about this I think this is a cool card um I you know I typically tend to be the person who plays at least in Hearthstone the more controlling decks that are looking to stop my opponent from uh from beating me up and get to you know the, the powerful late game but this is the sort of thing that gets me to play aggro because I like this